evening, everybody. I'll go ahead and um, kick things off so we can get started. My name is Robert Watkins. Um, I'm city staff, and I will just be making sure that things run smoothly um, on the virtual side of things for uh, tonight's meeting. This is the March 2022 Board of Architectural Review meeting. Um, before I hand things over to the chair of the BAR, Brett Gastinger, um, I will just go through a few items. First of all, I'll introduce um, everybody who's on screen right now. So anybody who's watching from home um, will just know who's who. So first we have the chair of the BAR, Brett Gastinger. We're also joined by the vice chair, Sherry Lewis. Um, we're also joined by additional BAR members, Jody Lehendro, David Temmerman, Robert Edwards, Clayton Strange, and James Ziemer. And um, I'm joined by my colleague on city staff, Jeff Werner as well. Um, throughout the meeting, uh, folks will join or leave um, the meeting as necessary. Um, so you might see some additional faces on the screen. Um, for anybody who might be watching at home, um, we have uh, some places on the agenda where you can provide public comment if that's something that you wish to do. Um, for tonight's agenda, the primary place will be um, on the agenda uh, bef uh, before the consent agenda, where uh, we'll allow public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, if you wish to provide comment, you'll need to register for this meeting through Zoom on the city's website on the city calendar. Uh, and then once you join the meeting, you'll be able to provide comment. Um, additionally, uh, it does, other than um, a preliminary discussion, we won't have um, applicants or project representatives hopefully joining the call um, to provide presentations. But um, if, if that does so happen um, uh, for the applicants, I will just scan through pages of the packet to your application for visual aid. So if you want me to um, show something, I can just share my screen uh, and go to that page number. Um, so with that, uh, I can pass things over to Brett Gastinger and we might take uh, periodic breaks as needed, uh, but our chair will direct us uh, to when those are necessary. Thanks. Great, thank you, Robert. Uh, welcome to this regular monthly meeting of the Charlottesville Board of Architectural Review. Uh, Robert has already given a pretty good rundown of how uh, the evening will work. And since we, we, other than the consent agenda, we do not have any projects that are that are uh, being considered for, uh, for a vote. We do have several preliminary discussions. I'll describe the prelim preliminary discussion process a little bit further. Um, the, we will um, give the presenter uh, several minutes to present the project. And then uh, the discussion for those um, can unfold as is required. And so we encourage all of those uh, presenting preliminary discussions to be specific as to the kinds of questions that you would uh, like us to address in, in the preliminary review, we will take cues from you. If uh, in through the course of the meeting, anyone uh, is speaking before the board, please identify yourselves and provide your address. And comments should be limited to the BAR's purview, uh, that is regarding only the exterior aspects of the project. Following, um, uh, following discussion, um, and before, um, then the applicant will have time to respond. <clears throat> so uh, we will go ahead and begin with uh, an opportunity to hear matters from the public that are not on the agenda. Or if there's anyone attending that would like to comment on projects that are listed in the consent agenda, and uh, you'd have up to three minutes. Um, if you uh, wish to provide comment, please raise your hand in the participant tab. Mr. Chair, we have uh, three attendees right now, and none of them are raising their hand. Okay. Excellent. Um, I would. Uh, I will make a motion of on the consent agenda that has a few. Um, uh, minor changes to the uh, meeting minutes, unless there are any other comments or uh, on the consent agenda from the board. No, okay. I will uh, move to approve the consent agenda with the following um, three changes 
uh, uh, typos that it should be corrected for meaning um, in the in the July 20th meeting minutes. The first is on page 14, fifth, uh, par fifth paragraph, uh, balls should be walls. Um, in the same paragraph, vanity should be humanity. <laughs> and on page 19, in the, um, in the motion or the rec 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 record of the motion, uh, it should be that we move to accept deferral uh, rather than referral. And those are my only changes. Who so says spelling some... doesn't count? <laughs> <laughs> Do I hear a motion a second? I'll second. I also wondered if you'd accept a friendly amendment to your motion, Mr. <laughs> Chair, to correct um, Tony Laboa's name on the application for 223 West Main, um, wherever it appears in that staff report and application. Gladly accept that amendment. Um, great. So with the motion and the second, I'll call a vote. Mr. Lahendra? Aye. Mr. Gastinger? Aye. Mr. Timmerman? Um, that Aye. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Edwards? Aye. Mr. Strange? Aye. And Mr. Zemer? Aye. Um, thank you. The vote is unanimous. Excellent. So we're off and running uh, to item number five, which is our first preliminary discussion, 1301 Portland Street. I know we're joined by um, Kevin Schaefer. Um, and Jeff, did you want to um, provide a rundown on this or do you just want to dive into the discussion? You're muted, but it sounds like we can dive right in. Um, Kevin, are you online yet? Um, if, if not, we, I can send him a quick email and we might wanna jump into some of the other questions that might be remaining. Okay. Um, just in case he was planning on logging in 10 minutes from now or something. That's fine. Yeah. One, of, one of the preliminary discussions they were not able to attend, is that correct? Um, yes, uh, actually uh, all of them except for, for Kevin. So and it looks like Kevin's online anyway, oh. so yeah. yeah. Kevin, we're running ahead of schedule, so. Uh, wow, you guys are running fast today. You caught us off guard a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, we can we can talk about something else in the meantime if, if you need to. No, time. no, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, Robert, are you able to, am I able to share my screen? Um, no, but I have the packet that you sent is, uh, has, if there are any new drawings, you can send them to me and I can share or I can share what you sent. Uh, no, I think that packet will be just fine. Um, okay. Robert and Jeff, um, thank you so much for getting us on to tonight's agenda. Um, we were having continued conversation throughout the month since the last time we spoke in front of you. Um, Breck, thanks very much as well for um, meeting with us recently. Uh, I have with me Bob Pinio again, um, principal of Design Develop, and we also have Edward Carrington, who is the owner's representative um, on this project. Um, Robert, if we could go maybe just to, yeah, I think right here is a great place for us to start. And, and so, um, you're gonna see obviously today is a much less developed um, model and presentation than what was presented previously, but there's an idea here that we're, that we're testing and we want feedback on more than anything. Um, so with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Bob and let him uh, give us a brief rundown. Great, thanks, Kevin. Thanks everybody for uh, taking your time to, to uh, serve the city and help us uh, work this, uh, this, this problem out. Um, so basically, um, we, in retrospect, and as we were presenting the last um, iteration, this uh, nagging idea of what place making is and what, how, to, how to make places um, 
And the Sanborn maps kind of identify, uh, let's say, a particular acute problem that's happening along Wirtland Street. And it's really just an experiential, you know, you're walking down Wirtland Street, and there's a lot of context. And then all of a sudden, there's a kind of a bend in the road that happens um, right about, uh, you know, 12th and a half street. Um, and things start to change. Um, and there are missing gaps and missing teeth along the Wirtland Ave, you know, um, Avenue, uh, but then there's a kind of a distinct change at that, and we'll show you a diagram that kind of illustrates where that happens. But in the in the idea of making places and um, trying to let's say stitch together a, a feeling of the street, and this is all in the context. We're not necessarily historian. We're not historians. Um, we're I, at, at at the best we're trying to make places. Um, so we see this Sanborn map, and we see that there's a disjunction between Wirtland, the two Wirtland streets. There's a misconnection, um, and it gets resolved eventually over time. But what you're seeing here is the context of, of what was there and then also what was kind of obliterated. And the, the salmon color shows kind of distinct changes of that fabric, but the fabric was never really connected anyway. Um, in so many ways, like sec, uh, 12th and a half and 13th Street, there wasn't a connector there. In time, there was, but that's where this kind of just disjunction comes. So basically, after we, you know, the first iteration where we met with you, we started thinking about, we were always thinking about street wall, um, but what is this experience? What, what if we add another building mass to this historic structure? What does the feel of the street look like? Um, what's the cadence of it? Um, what are some of the rules that are already in place? And somewhat, it feels a little artificial in that what we're looking at is the historic structure uh, of property and location of housing mass to, to, you know, but it's a completely different scale than what we see today. And that's the pressure of urbanism, uh, you know, taking bigger lots into smaller lots and the capacity to you know, bring people closer to the, you know, to uh, populated areas. So it's a big, big question. In the end, we're trying to make better places. Um, so this is what the context of what we, what we have, and maybe we can step into the next uh, slide. And one of the more important things, and Brecht is really in, in, in inspirational, helpful in trying to figure this out is, um, is that as you remember, we did the Kai Sai house on, uh, on Madison. Um, and there was, it was uh, an invention of sorts to invent a new facade where there wasn't one. Um, but we looked at the street wall and we tried to identify what placemaking looks like. Uh, in this particular place, and Brecht also had an insightful thing is we, we could create more street wall of the historic fabric and try to, uh, let's say, mimic that cadence of, of uh, and that rhythm of, of street wall. Uh, but what we're sh shaped with here is an existing large agrarian uh, lot, and its and the and its relationship with this house is really kind of an anomaly uh, to the street. Uh, some of the strengths of that, if you go back in time. Um, this is 13 and a half, right? 13 and a half was the front entrance, the front drive for this particular property. So his trying to, you know, replicate, let's say, or at least um, uh, nod to the past, that front entrance to the, the to that property is, is really significant. Um, so that's one of the things in history that we were trying to focus in on. The next uh, uh, slide, if you would. This, this is a very quick uh, and dirty slide that we were working on at last um, BAR meeting. And it's this idea of what does this street wall actually look like? And if you can remember the, the Sanborn map, that blue purple, that blue uh, circle there, that's where it all kind of, there was not a connection between work and street. Eventually there was. It wasn't aligned, so it, it, it's a really dis, uh, it's a really significant disjunction in the street wall. And plan left or plan, let's say west, um, it's the 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 fabric really starts to fall apart. Where there's this regular cadence of a a a a on either side uh, to a certain point to that juncture, 
then there's a smaller cadence of C, but then some of the newer buildings has really thrown off the pattern of development and street wall. So we thought, well, how do we, if we're trying to create street wall and we're trying to you know, synthesize and make the experience of Wortland's uh, street more conducive to the pedestrian experience and you know, uh, think about the past, how do we, how do we, how do we put those, those two uh, um, you know, uh, ideas together? So next slide, please. So what's happened, and it's kind of a shame what's happened to this uh, to this property, is because of it's because of uh, the pressures of urban growth, um, the pressure to kind of develop back lot you know um, um, opportunities. Uh, this driveway has kind of dislocated and disconnected the house from its historic front. Uh, so, and that's expediency, let's say, or uh, there was, I think at the time, an effort to save some large trees that are, you know, just off the side of this image. Um, but historically, and kind of, it, it feels much more suburban um, and kind of, uh, you know, uh, splintered in a way. So one of the other things we're trying to do is to stitch back the house, the house's relationship to the street wall, but also give it some gravitas um, as well. Next slide, please. Kevin, I'm gonna turn to you. For yeah, so all these ideas and evaluations of the street wall on Orland just kind of raised some big picture questions and presented some big picture opportunities. Um, you know, and I think the most significant one of this is how do we protect and preserve and give gravitas, as Bob put it, um, to these historic structures after the context that's um, around them has changed significantly over time or even eroded. Um, so, Robert, I'll, I'll go quickly through these next couple of slides just as um, as we move through it. This is just a diagram of the existing conditions. The historic house, as you can see, sits pretty far away from Wortland Street at this time. And as we um, noted, the drive aisle cuts in front of that house and really kind of changes the relationship to Wortland Street. Um, the, the house has the benefit of being on access with 13th Street, which was its main drive aisle. Um, and that relationship is still there and is still important as you come down 13th Street. But much of the um, much of the street wall considerations along Wortland have changed largely in part because of that very obtrusive drive aisle that comes in front of the historic house. The next slide. So here's an opportunity that we saw um, that could solve a few problems. And one of the major problems that we heard or major concerns that we heard, um, were, there were two significant concerns from the previous hearing. One was the drive aisle entrance coming off of Wortland um, and then the two is the building mass um, on the street wall at Wortland. Um, so here's an opportunity to, that requires a boundary line adjustment that requires some significant site plan considerations and things like that. We haven't, we haven't chased this idea down to its, to its full degree, but before we did, we wanted to get it in front of you and see, we could straighten the drive aisle and get it out of the front of the house uh, get it out of in front of that historic structure. And then we can move that historic structure some degree, some distance towards Wortland Street um, that would then give it a presence on Wortland Street. It would maintain that relationship with 13th Street, which is, you know, it's historic driveway. Um, it, it could uh, reinforce the street wall cadence that is typical along Wortland Street. Um, and it would give us an opportunity to, um, if you know, as I quoted in the previous uh, meeting, Mm -hmm. some of my favorite precedents or some of my favorite projects in town are the, the 600 West Main and um, the Quirk. And the defining features of that is that they're tucking a larger building mass behind a historic structure. And so now there's all of a sudden a, a much larger area for building in the rear of the house and we're bringing uh, the historic structure to prominence. So on the next slide, you'll see that idea kind of brought all the way to fruition. We're, um, Suggesting a much narrower mass with opportunities for step back here um, that relates to the historic structure mass uh, on the street, but then the larger building mass could happen towards the rear of the site where the historic house used to sit. Um, and then there's 
there's a lot of opportunities here for interior courtyards, for front yards and landscaping that would be appropriate within this district. Um, there's opportunities for enhanced pedestrian experiences um, and pedestrian entrances. There's a vehicular entrance that happens um, off the side drive aisle and not off Wortland Street. Um, so there's, there seems to be a number of positives that could come from this idea. Uh, we're looking to the board today for guidance on this idea in relationship to its, you know, the, the sanctity of the historic structure to its context. How do we, how do we balance that? How do we make that relationship in a, in a district that's really going through a lot of change and is, and is set to go through a lot of change? There's a, uh, you know, the developers, uh, very, Bo is very um, open to, you know, this conversation. Um, one of the things that we find intriguing is how to support the existing structure. And it takes, a, it's gonna take a lot of capital, a lot of money and effort to move the house but there's also a possibility and a, a reality that newer foundations, um, you know, a restoration of that to move a house, you have to, you have to make sure that it's, it's stable enough. So there's a, there's uh, a, you know, there's going to be restoration of that house and its foundation and its place. We will make it last another, you know, 150, 200 years. Um, so, we think that that's a benefit. Uh, obviously, all these things cost money. Um, so the idea of kind of uh, putting putting pieces in the right place is, is really what we're trying to what we're trying to get to. Robert, could you go to the next one? So this is um, a summary of those advantages, as Bob just mentioned. Provide new foundations for this historic structure. Um, provide structural stability for the next two hundred years. Um, Go through some, you know, some amount of renovation project and rehabilitation on the existing house. Um, give prominence to its street wall context. Maintain its axial relationship with 13th Street. Um, all these things I kind of talked about um, on the previous slide. So we can go ahead and go to the next one. This is a, a precedent that we would that we had noted um, just when kind of googling, you know, Charlottesville historic structure move. Um, and seeing what, what precedents were out there. I thought this was an interesting one. This is Varsity Hall at UVA. Um, Mr. Lahendro was involved heavily in this project and I, um, by all accounts, it was very successful and very um, um, you know, noteworthy. It brought new life to a, to a structure that was underutilized and also falling into disrepair. Um, and it brought it to a place where it has been rehabilitated and thoughtfully renovated and um, now is in a, a different location, but has the same historic structural fabric. So um, maybe we can, uh, I don't know if Mr. Lahendra is here, but um, you can weigh in on that thought. And then the next, the final slide is just um, the, this idea that is not uncommon in Charlottesville and these precedents that I've already that I've already mentioned here, this this marrying of new and old, and I think uh, Mr. Warner mentioned it um, thoughtfully last time. Is, is this is things you might be asked to weigh in on in the future as well? No, I, think the, I, I was going to say the house across the street from 1301 was moved back when I was in grad school. So I don't know, Brett, do you remember uh, like 98, 97, right next to the church, they mm. lifted it up and. Well, rolled it back to Wortland. So no, I don't remember that. But. Houses, I was always told houses don't weigh that much. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a few massing diagrams on the next couple of slides. If you just want to scroll through what we're thinking, again, there's a lot. There's when we have a building mass that's shielded from a historic structure, there's a lot more opportunities for step backs, for uh, scaling down our mass, scaling down our width. Um, scaling down our height on the street level and being more in kind with the uh, historic house. Um, so this is just, you know, nothing more than a massing diagram that got us a rough unit count at this point. And then the next slide shows the actual axial entrance on 13th Street and what that mass could feel like as well. Thank you guys uh, again for uh, getting us onto the agenda and just letting us kind of test this idea with you. We're eager to hear your feedback and we're happy to answer any questions you have for us. That's great. Thank you. 
and I guess I I just maybe summarize in that and I had a chance to talk with the design team and Mr. Carrington earlier last week, um, and they want to really want to just get a get a temperature check on the BAR about whether this is an idea that is worth pursuing. Obviously, this is a very a preliminary discussion, and uh, it involves moving a historic structure um uh in it as an attempt to address some of the concerns of the previous schemes um they've not my understanding is they've not um they're not discarding that scheme but they want to understand the the viability of this uh from the bar's point of view i'll start um personally i really like the idea it solves a lot of problems for the applicant but it also as the applicants stated, and I agree, it um, it helps the street wall on the street, and just yeah, it's been tucked back there too long. Um, it would certainly bring to prominence this historic structure. Um, my only comment is that it looks like if this were to be accomplished, there are two applications that we would need to look at, and we're bound by you know the job that we do. We're not just commenting about design in general, but um, we operate just uh, under certificates of appropriateness that are submitted to us, and this would would be two. One would be a vote to move, and I just emailed to BAR members and to staff and probably if the applicants haven't seen them, um, Bob and Kevin could get a copy of our guidelines for moving and demoing. They're pretty brief and they do include um, the National Register standards um, for any type of um, design review, um, but there's not a whole lot to them, frankly. And I think just looking at them really quickly as we were, as you were presenting, I think your applica application would hit on you know, favorably a lot of those criteria. So I would just say, you know, my initial look is that would be great. And then of course you'd have to come back with the COA for the actual new building. Um, and I, I don't, I'll leave it to, to Jeff as to, you know, whether those could be done at the same time, um, be nice if they could. I just don't know about sequencing. Um, That's a good question, and I, I, I can, I could look at that. Um, I think just, and sure, just to kind of piggyback on what you said, one of the things that would be, we'd certainly want to encourage is, you know, the tax credit opportunities are there. Uh, it would be to maybe make sure that, um, you know, whatever, you know, Kevin, Bob, but whatever you guys do, you are, um, you're not. Um, not look, you know, make sure that you can do something that keeps those credits intact if there's an opportunity for them, because they'd certainly be worthwhile on a project like this. So that that would be sort of one thing to think about is just explore, you know, what how far can you go and then still have those be viable. Um, I think um, I would say, you know, Sherry, you're right. It's, it's not a demolition, but the, the the only thing I would give caution on is there's an appeal of of a demolition or relocation request is, you know, when well, you talk about something that takes up a lot of pages in our ordinance, so it it might be worthwhile to do those separately, just just so. I don't know that that that's my initial response, but that certainly doesn't need to be the answer. That that's what's what I'm thinking about. Other thoughts from the board? Any initial reactions? Yeah, I agree. I think this is better than what we saw the first go round. Um, I think moving the structure does make some sense. It's, it's still on the original property for the structure. So, you know, oftentimes you have buildings that actually get really moved, you know, several right. miles away or something. Um, and so I think that helps argue the case for, for shifting it forward. I was curious about the, you know, as your diagram showed, currently the house is kind of a skewed. And I didn't know if, if that skew is to Wortland Street. And therefore, by correcting that, are you 
on axis with 13 and a half street or is it now just kind of uh flush with wortland but now not on axis with 13 and a half does that make sense yeah it does it's a it's a good question and um it's hard to tell why there's a five degree skew um it is not on axis on 13th street and it doesn't seem to be parallel with wortland street either um i think it was probably just a rural condition where it was built um, before there was any other road other than Main Street, which was a three notch at that time. So by correcting the skew, do you fix both problems? Potentially, I mean, I think that would be an area where we weigh in on um, from your y'all's perspective, is, is the skew important and should be retained or right. uh, is it more important to address the axial condition on 13th Street? Yeah, I think that would take some more research, but um, it's just an interesting question. James, um, it, looks, it looks to me like 13th and Wortland are 90 degrees. And the odd one is five, you know, it's the, it's yeah. the house itself. So if you, if you correct it, now maybe um, this is one of the things that Brett brought up, which I enjoy, which is, well, they, yeah, but that's what, you know, it's a, it's a construct in some ways. So you move it forward, but you leave it on the skew. That mm -hmm. leaves this anomaly. Is that, is that an important anomaly? It, it would tell some kind of story. Yeah, and still incorporate it. It's it's a little yeah. odd. I mean, I think that we may be jumping to a conclusion that the 13th and a street and a half street is is the driveway. That's a 1907 map that you're showing. You know, the driveway may have been long before that, before any of that street grid was there, and right. was right. on access with the house. Um, so, the the only other thought I had was uh, in terms of your the plan um, the for your new building, I guess I would kind of like it if the front wall of the new building, the Wortland Street wall of the new building, were actually in line with the front wall of the house as opposed to the front edge of the front porch of the house. So basically just pull it back another whatever, 10 feet or something. Um, and I just think that would again give the Wharton Baker house a little bit more prominence you know as you're walking down the sidewalk you'll see that porch not be you know blocked by the new building yeah i think it's a good comment shave a I little bit of square footage sorry <laughs> i'd just like to reiterate what james uh, said and um how maybe a little bit more investigation um historically uh, digging digging into it a little bit more uh one thing that i noticed in um looking at the map just i don't have it in front of me right now but i was curious about this skew, like everybody else's you know why did it happen um it obviously um makes the house sit a little uneasy um on the lot currently um but i also noticed on that um the original map that you showed um, that there was another house that sort of had the same skew, I think to the right. Um, so I just, I don't know, I, that leads me to think, well, what was there before? Um, you know, um, I'd love to see some, you know, some diagrams to, that tell a little bit more of the story of what was there. And, um, and that could be a really great um, design incentive or, you know, an influencer of, of the design moving forward. Um, to at least, um, you know, um, trace some sort of vestige of what was there, tell the story of the site um, in, in, a, in some way that's a little bit uh, richer than, you know, well, we're going to leave the, the, the skew because it was skewed before. Um, I'd, be cons I'd be interested in understanding if there was a, some sort of a little road or a path or, you know, some sort of historical context that, you, that would be um fairly easy to weave into the you know your new design um and um just an interesting story to tell you know so that um when people like us are sitting around in 40 years and looking at the map um they have a there's a there's a there's a link between what was you know 100 years ago and what we're doing now what you're planning on doing and what they're looking at um you know uh, at that point um, so I just think that kind of, you know, feeding the, the site with that kind of um, background is, um, can be a really 
just kind of an interesting thing to do. I um, also agree with everybody that I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a great idea. Um, I love the idea of interacting with the, with the street, making the um, house more prominent. Um, I guess the question for you guys I have is, um, you know, you mentioned as a, as a considerable uh, investment in moving the house. And so I'd be interested in hearing how you want to repurpose it. You know, it's one thing just leaving a house, an old house sitting there and you build around it, you know, I don't know what you do with it, but um, uh, putting um, uh, this kind of money into it, you know, moving it, putting on a new foundation um, uh, may lead to, you know, some more potential um, um, kind of a higher quality reuse. So I don't know if, if that's been kind of put on the table or if things are so early right now, you know, um, but um, it would be really interested to hear about um, ways of reusing that in some, some sort of interesting ways, whether it ties into the new development or it's just, um, you know, uh, something in and of itself that um, uh, gets repurposed. Yeah, good suggestion. I'm not sure if I have an answer for you yet, but we can come back with an answer. Clayton or Robert, anything you want to add at the moment? No, I think I, I would just echo the comments. I think it's definitely an improvement on what we saw before. And I, uh, I appreciated the discussion about the way that the urban context had been kind of transformed beyond recognition since uh, the 1907 map. I think that was a really good point to make. And I, I would even suggest that if, if we're relocating it, maybe maintaining that, that five degree angle isn't so important. It's, it might be more important to set up a new relationship to the street that exists today if we're going to go through the uh, through the effort of relocating it. In the end, it might be about having a, a relationship that makes sense today with the context we have and that the building itself is what is important to uh, preserve and maybe its relationship to the context is kind of beyond repair at this point. Those are my two cents. Well, I, I agree with that, Clayton, and I wanna maybe add a couple of things that um, might be useful. I think it would be um, good for as you, for the discussion of this project as you guys are describing it to the public and to us, to others, is to distinguish about um, the things that you are doing that are relative to the historic fabric versus the things that you're doing that are creating good pedestrian um, experience, uh, good streets. Because when you say something like missing teeth, that suggests a street where there might have been fully developed, but there are buildings that were knocked down, and that's not our condition. Um, in fact, in this case, the quirkiness and the missing teeth is a function of the change of the urban fabric over time. Um, so um, I think there are reasons that we want to improve the street wall, uh, but not. it's not because that was the condition. It was because that's what makes for a good contemporary pedestrian condition today. And that's what Clayton was um, talking about. So I think as long as you make that clear that we're not trying to recreate a condition that didn't ever exist, but that might have a good other, re other good urban reasons to happen, I think that it, it would just be good to keep those straight. I, I agree with what everyone has said. And I really appreciate you guys coming strong with the history. Um, I know you said you're not a historian, but mad respect and props for bringing <laughs> the historical uh, research uh, to the table. Um, I'm excited to see what the designs um, will look like in the future, um, just because I think having that cultural and architectural uh, history um, and knowledge of um, Sanborn maps and, and what the city looked like I think there's a way for you to really make a cohesive um, relationship between this new building or this new mass structure and the historic architecture. Um, I know right now it's just preliminary, but it looks like th there's there's no conversation happening. And I think there's a way that you you can you can open up that that spatial conversation uh, between the two spaces.
agree with you. But one of the things we're really excited about, Robert, is the idea of a pedestrian front, you know, that has, you know, um, a, you know, uh, Clayton, you'd mentioned a porch. Maybe our building has some of those same features, but being able to pull the pedestrian the vehicular away from Wirtland, tucking it in, the massing of those two buildings. Jody talked about, um, you know, a, a building that helped that, you know, um, uh, was a uh, commiserate, let's say, I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, that has more in line with the, uh, with the historic structure, whether it's punched openings or gable front or something, you know, not to replicate it, but to, uh, to, to, to give something complementary to it. So we're really looking forward to, to that exercise. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that's about the time that we had allotted for this conversation, but with Kevin, um, Bob, or is there anything else that you wanted to um, ask? Um, no, thank you guys very much for your time. I appreciate it. I will say, you know, of course, now that we've gotten the thumbs up from everybody, I will say we are, you know, we're, we're still, it, it requires the uh, agreement of everybody in the back condo association, which is a, a significant task to, um, get that boundary line adjusted and to get, you know, drive access easements and things like that. But this at least gives us the, um, the go ahead to pursue, <clears throat> excuse me, to pursue this path. <clears throat> excuse me. So thank, thank you very much for the time and thank you for the feedback. And, and yeah, I'm, I will offer, if you want, um, we'll say, just looking at the um, historic survey, it's interesting that the um, a great granddaughter reported that uh, the man who built it built it himself and made a lot of of mistakes so <laughs> it's 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 crooked um but it's uh the uh again we're, we are um ahead of schedule and so again i just would encourage if there's anything else about this that would be helpful to discuss um you know, we do we we can do that if, if or in my opinion you can and it's up to you all but i would i would say if there's something that sort of you know you talked about the movement of the house are there any other elements that um that would be helpful and just encourage you to speak now maybe since we have the opportunity and i sorry my dog. i say that because you all know that we don't get evenings that often that you know are short nights um and for all i know the next meeting we'll have 12 items on the agenda and we'll be here till till, till 11 o'clock so it's uh okay. No, take advantage what, it, what, what you may be alluding to, and I think is a good discussion point, is um, the trees that I believe, what we believe is that the, the, the entrance drive to the condo kind of snaked in front of that historic structure to avoid those trees. Um, those trees have, have been there for a long time, and unfortunately, they are not in good health. The one, one has been taken down already because it was um, dead and was losing branches significantly. And so if you look on Google Earth, you'll see a stump now or above Google Street View, you'll see a stump of one of the, the two significant trees. And if um, we're, we're happy to happy to share um, arborist reports and, and photos and things like that, but the, the other tree is in quite poor health as well. So it, it was something that we were considered of. And when you when you see the the site on Google Earth, they're on Google Street View where you go there, it is a large looming tree that's right there. Um, it's, it's just uh, unfortunate that it's very, very old and not in great health. Um, it, looks, it looks better in this image than it, than it actually is if you went there today. Yeah, this is back in 2019. So it's been a full three years since this photo was taken. So in discussions with Breck, you know, that we're trying to piece this all back together. We would obviously plant new trees. Those trees would be small at first, but they'd have the opportunity to, you know, re-engage the street. Um, we'd spend, you know, and, and this is just to answer the big question. We have a lot of work to do to stitch this, uh, this concept together, architecturally, the landscape, history um massing you know we, that's but we didn't want to go down that route until we knew conceptually that this is something that was agreeable to everybody's so but make no mistake we know that there's a lot of work here um part of this that tree realignment of the street is fixing the first sin or one of the sins which was that that 
suburban um, entrance. Um, and it really is not typical of anything. It, it's, it just doesn't fit it, and it, it hurts uh, the connection to the house and the street. All the things that we are trying to fix and ameliorate, um, that's one of the things that we would try to, to fix. Obviously, the, the, the pain of that is the tree. Um, but the tree is not doing well. Um, so it would, you know, again, trying to throw out big, big picture concepts, realignment of street, bring this, the, the house forward, um, occupy uh, entrance, you know, a, a, a forecourt to the building. Um, those are all the things that we need to do. We need to do. So it's an important piece just to get your temperature on, I guess. I mean, I think of you that what I've heard today is that that this is an idea worth pursuing. I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think that should be mistaken for an approval. Um, but no. I think that given given you know the the response, I think there's a lot there's a lot of promise with this um, approach. We would need I think we'd need to have more information about that tree. I can't remember if you had an arborist look at that one or not, but a, a report will cer certainly help our. Uh, deliberations. Um, and I would recommend that you also continue to reach out to Mr. Mahendro, um, given his ex, you know, experience in this kind of uh, project. And, um, and, and certainly he's, he's one of the more esteemed historians on our, on our board. Um, so I think uh, it would probably be good that he, this will be a project that he, he, he would, I think he'll have some opinions on. Um, but um, but you don't need unanimity anyway. So it's, um, but I think uh, what I've heard is, is a, at least a support in studying this idea further. Great, thank you guys so much, appreciate it. Okay, uh, I think we'll move on to the next uh, project, which is 32 University Circle preliminary discussion. Right, it's uh, also interesting reading this, that. You know, unlike Windhurst, which was you know, described as a manor house, uh, uh, Wortland Street really was a small parcel. Uh, it was so it wasn't some the center of some mass uh, uh, estate. Uh, and uh, interesting stuff. So, um, what I have some notes I want to work off. So, this project um, that is. I have a better image. I thought I sent something with a, some better photos in it, but um, yeah. So the, is it small because of me or because of, there we go. So we have here is the, the it's four-sided building. Each one looks like this. Um, you've got these, the, the corner um, elements have the, the, looks like a six over six double hung. And then the, um, uh, that inner bay on all four sides has, uh, it has some double hungs over the, the entrance and then it's got those old metal uh, casement windows. Um, so some interesting stuff. However, this building is non-contributing. Um, so Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, so that's where we get into this kind of, um, you know, I think obviously it would be something that you would, could probably encourage to get listed, you know, or designated. I mean, you know, now that that's not necessarily the local designation, but the it is um, is a neat old building. Um, but it is it is not. It could be knocked down without um, BAR review. So the question is, what would we be? And I don't know the extent of. Are they thinking they have to replace all of them? Some of them. I, you know, it, it's a, um, and when we didn't get some information from them and that Robert and I decided, well, you know, let's still kind of maybe tease out a discussion here of, of um, you know, typically we were looking at a, a, a house and, and the, you know, to provide that, that window survey and tell us why these have to be replaced and tell us, you know, et cetera, give us photographs. Um, does that matter here? And if 
if you know yes or no, uh, then what would that mean? Um, so I, don't, I I'm a little bit um, the the guidelines are a little silent on on windows on a uh, non contributing structure. So just I don't mean to just throw a curveball at you, but I I'm just curious what maybe you all had some thoughts on that. What year? What year was this, Jeff? Uh, it's in that survey, right? Yeah, it should be in there. Um, Nineteen forty-seven. Okay. I built right when all the, you know the. Copley Hill was going up and all those trailers and they still didn't have enough places for people. So, um, so yeah, did, is it a, um, the, are they windows you want to replicate? Are they windows? What's, how would we kind of, I, I don't really, I don't really, and I was hoping maybe, you know, Brecker, you know, you would say, oh yeah, back in five years ago, we had one of these or, or James, you might have a, um, actually, James, you did. You had mentioned some time ago that UVA has a window replacement policy. I, I, I it always pops up on my list to remind you to, to you know, because I think windows, windows are going to be part of our big headache um, going forward. Um, okay. So they, they, so they, they need to come because they're in the district, but they're not correct. contributing, and they want to replace all of them, or. Let's so, assume so. Yeah, they. I think they're not sure what exactly they're getting into. So, um, and their original windows. I, I think the assumption can be made. Yeah, but I would say maybe don't singularly think about it in terms of this building. Um, and if you say, "Hey, Jeff, put together a staff report and give it to us," that's fine. <laughs> you know. I don't mean to just throw your curve in the middle of the meeting, but it was uh, still wanted to see what you thought. So like I had here, you know, is it legit to say, you know, replicate a period or, you know, do I, you know, it, it gets into some, some interesting, um, you know, questions about, you know, preservation. Uh, if they can, I, I would know that I would say to them, you can't do vinyl. Uh, that would be it that would, as far as my direction would go. It's a funky building. I don't know. It's it's an oddball, and there's all kinds of things going on in that facade. Um, How is this different than 500 Court Square? Wasn't there like a window beef a couple of months ago? And that was a good point that Robert, when I you know Watkins brought up, is that you know we encouraged them to come up with a window replacement plan. Um, and come up with something that would say sort of there's a standard that as they replaced windows, they were, um, you know, using something that, that, that was at least similar that fit. So, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the thing here was, is to say. That was the school? Was that? That was the school? That, that was uh, the, remember the- Monticello Hotel. Hotel, yeah. Oh, the Monticello Hotel, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. the trick there was you had multiple owners because they were condos, right? Yeah. Is it is it possible that they replaced the the smaller windows and then left the the larger ones? I mean, they're obviously you know you've got double hungs on the two sides and then the sort of the more slender steel windows from the '40s on the inside. It, it's possible. I I, I don't. I don't know. I, mean, I think Jeff's trying to get at a bigger picture question, um, which is, you know, for a non-contributing building in a historic district, are we okay with letting them replace windows? And does that set a precedent for the next door neighbor who might be a contributing building saying, well, you let them do it. Why can't I do it? I think that's the bigger context question. Sure. And Jeff, to your earlier question, uh, UVA doesn't necessarily have a policy that I know of. We typically, on historic buildings, restore rather than replace windows. Um, the, I mean, the kind of large exception that we've done recently would be the McCormick Road 
dormitories. They replaced all those windows when we went through, but you know, on the rotunda, on the library, uh, we're restoring windows. We're not replacing. Yeah. My my inclination, let me test this out, see what you guys think, is that even though this is, might not be labeled as a historic or a contributing building, the windows are are part of a pattern that are is replicated in the district. And if they were to change substantially, would could have an impact on the district. So I don't think we need to do necessarily um, say preemptively do them any favors and apply our typical standard relative to windows unless they want to come and make a pitch for a different strategy. And that would be to you know try to repair where possible, um, and if not, replacing them in kind. Um, they may, I mean, they may if they had a, a a designer on board that wanted to make a different um, pitch that the that were that they felt was appropriate to the building, we could consider it then. But I don't think we need to preemptively say you don't need to come to us. I tend to agree, especially kind of walking down the street and seeing how it's it is such an oddball. It's out of you know in scale and in form. Everything else is pretty smaller scale residential. Um, you know, um, I, I think that's why I was asking about the the windows because there is kind of a um, sense of like there's a there's a there's a discrepancy there between those older, you know, older um, 1940s steel um, that you see in the middle, and I don't know the old, the other windows might be um, same age too, um, but just um, trying to maintain a certain sense of quality along that street um, seems um, a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, just a lot of really nice houses, um, really nice street. I, I don't know if you guys have it up on street view, but the um, really interesting cornice detail, um, or what I don't know what the proper word would be, but to me up over top of the entry, there's this strange, um, Art Deco thing. Um, I don't know, always, always interesting. And then, and then someone, of course, you know, busted a hole to put a dryer vent through it. But um, it's uh, so, you know, in terms of like preservation, this is something I, I struggle with where they say, well, if you're going to replace, then don't make it look, don't try to replicate. Well, but Windows, we do try to do that. So, you know, in some ways you'd say, all right, well, if you're going to take out the old, then, you know, put in a bunch of, you know, one light casements. Um, so I don't know, maybe sometimes looking at it as an extreme is a way to, to, to get where you want to go. Um, but it, it's a, could we, can the BAR say you can't replace windows? I mean, you can say, you can say what they can replace them with, but can you say you can't replace them in a building that they could knock down without BAR review? That's where it gets really strange. So, um, some, and I agree. I think it. I, I don't understand why people are so enthusiastic about tearing out and replacing windows. I mean, my house. I I saved a lot of money. You know, yeah, they're not wonderfully energy efficient, but you know, you, you're never going to make back the money. These people, you know, repairing them is easy. So, I mean, it's something you know we could certainly encourage. And I, I think when Robert and I talk to them say, you know, what's the problem that you're trying to fix? Because I hear all the time, oh, we want to save energy. Okay, so at $1,600 a window times how many windows, you tell me how many years, you know, it's going to take you to get that back. But um, yeah, I think the window companies put a lot of time oh, yeah. and energy in. Oh, yeah. That's oh, the yeah. sort of bottom line. So it would be, um, I think some, you know, yes, yeah, some homework to be done. I don't know, my, my thought would be fine. You want to replace the windows then, I think this is sort of an interesting building. Uh, I like, I would, I would say, you know, you can do double hungs and, you know, I like the casements and you can replicate these windows with, with current products, um, you know, provided they're not vinyl. Um, but is that, you know, is that the goal? So. I think the elephant in the room are the air conditioning units in the windows. I'm, fa I'm fascinated that they're not going to do central air and they're 
They want to replace windows, which kind of begs the question, these windows will have to be operable. I just blew up the front facade photo. You know, half mm -hmm. those windows are open, including the casement ones. It's good yeah, that they still great. operate. Yeah. I mean, and actually it's cool how that, what is it, eight over eight, um, yeah. eight four, yeah, four over four. Um, it's amazing that the outside ones actually open like that. Um, mm -hmm. which is yeah, quite, yeah. it's quite attractive actually. Um, and that the, I guess the interior ones, the ones on the top are static and they don't move, but I mean, and, and on the, the, the ones on the sides, um, you know, the three over fours, they've got a couple of, they've got one unit there. So <laughs> like, I don't know how they're going. And there's another one actually, there are two on the kind of return wall on the right. Um, oh, and there are three. There's one on each level. <laughs> um, so I, I find this a really curious request. I, I would auger to keep any original windows. I think the casements are really special. And that's a lot of light into these living areas. I, we're not talking about changing the openings, but, um, but I would just think some grout and a little bit of repairs. Some of those last a long time. I also really do... It's it's a not all that attractive building that looks like it has some stuff done to it, but there is a surround that is on the three over fours and the casement windows that is consistent throughout the building, and I wouldn't want that messed with because I do think it's as much as it can be a defining feature of this building. Um, so those are my comments. You know, I. Can think of other things about this building that need to be improved besides the windows. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, real. You're talking about replacing. I mean, you've got it. They would have to be operable to put the units back in. I don't know. Can we, can we swap some of the double hungs for for a landscape in the front? <laughs> right. <That's what> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't, am I allowed to say that? I don't know. You can. <laughs> yep. Well, and but knowing that it's not essentially aired building or it's insufficiently aired if it is, and these tenants have got these window units in there, the replacements have to be operable, you know. So you're talking about some ability for to have sashed or casement windows or something. And that and that's where you know worry uh, windows always worry me because the you know the biggest complaint. And the, this is the um, the property inspection folks at, at, at neighborhood development, and there is the the state um, um, maintenance code. So it's there are there that's we're trying to figure out how to overlap some of the inspection of you know how are buildings looking relative, not necessarily the BAR criteria, but to, to that to that state code issue. So, um, but students will call and say, you know my landlords, the windows don't open. He won't make them, you know, they, they it's like a, almost a, a game. Well, not a game, but it's a way to, to just, you know, like one applying pressure to the other. And that is where I get calls and people say, well, you know, I've been cited by the city. I have to replace the windows. What do I do? And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to people through like, you go get some rope at Martin's Hardware and you can fix the sash weights. But it is a... I just really stuck on a non-contributing building, what I'm going, what I should tell them. And, uh, and what I've heard is we're sort of going back to, all right, what's historically on this building and how do we protect the character of that? And it seems, uh, I mean, I don't disagree at all. It's just, it's a, but it's certainly something I mean, we need to figure out. My question is if it's in this historic district, regardless of it's contributing or non-contributing, if they're not going to demolish it, but they want to make a change, is it under our purview? Mm -hmm. Yes. Then, then the answer is, if they want to replace the windows, they need to submit a COA of application, in my opinion. Okay. So I'll, yeah, and I'll do our best. I haven't really been able to talk to them. I, you know, I think they don't quite understand. Although I, I get, you know. I don't like when these people that own these buildings go, oh, I don't know, I don't know anything. It's like, well, yes, you do. So, you know, but the first, you know, line of defense is to sit down and say, what is it you want to accomplish with these windows? And, and you know, I don't care if, you know, whether it's a 50-year-old building or a you know, 150-year-old building, you know, first thing is, 
can I save you some money on this? But um, it is a, um, it's something to think about and, um, and, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think, unless you all have something, you know, you suggest I do homework on or look at. Um, by the way, speaking of um, inspections of, of properties, I, I sent out the email about 605 Preston Place. Did you all see that? <laughs> Where they are, um, they're in the process of, of doing some, some significant rehabilitation and working with DHR on that. So that was um, that was good to see. Um, and you know, now they still need to do it, but it, it is. Um, that work is in process. And um, um, so it's always, I, you know, tax credits are not the easiest thing to, to wrangle with. Um, I can say that personally, because I wasn't able to get them, but they, um, it's always something I want to encourage people to do and, 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 and try to help people when they can. Um, all right, what's the next thing on the list? We are moving on to 1901 East Market Street. IPP within the Woolen Mills district. So the, the thing is, I know um, Clayton and, and David, uh, you weren't on at, at the initial part of the meeting, but this is also a, a good opportunity for um, me to, to, this is where we have a project that's within a historic conservation district, but it is, uh, it was designated an individually protected property by the city um, uh, long before it was incorporated into, or the historic conservation district was created around it. So this is one of those situations where um, the, the more rigid rules apply. So even being a conservation district, we look at this, you know, at the same um, microscope as we would look at something within an ADC district. So that's the, um, I thought it was a, a you know, at least we could kind of an example of, of sometimes where are these things the, the uh, straddle the line a little bit, and um, and then just the background. I, I was contacted by the owner and applicant uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, they're planning to make a submittal, but um, uh, John wasn't available tonight, and I but I said, hey, well, let me just ask the VAR, they have any initial thoughts and it's always an opportunity to give a, an applicant some feedback and, you know, however informal it might be. Uh, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's, there's nothing there. So, um, but, uh, so David and Clayton, you really, and, and of course everybody else, but uh, what was said earlier was just this. And if, if you look at this, the image there at the bottom, the south face, um, the south facing elevation, the that porch and that uh, the two twin windows on the on the left hand side. That's that's all there is of the original um, store and house, and then everything else that you see extending from that is was an addition from two thousand two. So the question, you know, I had and 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 you saw in my sketches, um, Robert. Do we have those sketches that I did? I, I'll pull those up as well. And just, you know, I mean, that was my responses to John. And I just was curious if that was, you know, something that you all felt made sense or, or felt stronger or less strong about. Can I interrupt just for a second? I had said in the pre-meeting, I'm going to recuse Don't. myself from consideration on this. I've represented the applicant, um, the owner of this on two different applications before the BAR. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> um, but I'm not representing the owner now, and I don't have a conflict as defined by, defined by the Conflict of Interest Act, but um, just would feel more comfortable not participating. So I'm going to turn off my video. Thank you, Sherry. Jeff, would you mind just going over your comments? I, I, I think I have an older version of the PDF. Um, I don't, I can't control the duber dabber. Uh, Robert, go to the, to the two elevations, uh, the, the renderings at the bottom and there. So 
And the other piece I'll say, you know, Clayton and David is, is that um, I, we get questions all the time from applicants and, and um, you know, sometimes I'll float it out to you all in an email. Uh, it, it's to me, it's always, you know, trying to, you know, give some feedback, give them, some, you know, help them out a little bit moving forward. We're not making decisions. We're, we're just, you know, building as we go. So, uh, and I, I've done this a lot, you know, brought questions to you all and, and you all don't have to offer comments. Um, you know, we're still have them, the applicant coming in, but it, it does sometimes help me look at something differently and help me see things. So with this one, when I first got it from John, uh, and it, I don't have the, the notes on this rendering, but you can see where the, the addition roof line and that, that um, the rake on that, that gable at the end there um, replicates the, you know, the profile, everything off the original. So it would have been one of those where, um, I, you know, 20 years ago, probably should have said that this addition looks too much like it was built with the house. Um, so then you go to the, the rendering at the bottom where the, the extension of the, 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 the new addition or suggested addition, and, you know, that middle section is certainly can't be um, confused with the, the original, but the, the roof line tends to be the same. And then popping out at the other end is, is that sort of a continuation of the roof that, um, that looks almost like it's uh, like the old house is enclosed within it and, and just sort of, so I, that was what I said to John, I felt like some, some variation in, in the entirety of that addition um, would be helpful. And then there's also in the, um, uh, James, my computer's telling me this, all right. Oh, okay, sorry, James Seymour just sent a note. The, and then the end elevation, uh, Robert, if you could scroll up to, to the rendering, uh, John's renderings. Um, yeah, you might have to rotate it. So there, use that one. So there on the end, um, the, the, the gable on the end of the addition, um, you know, again, are they, are they, are they respecting that um, or are they replicating? And, and I, I, it was the conversation you all had a month ago about mimicry that really jumped out at me. In fact, I, I think I put that in that summary. That was one of the comments I made to John is, are you mimicking? Are you respecting? Are you emulating? What is it? And so those are that kind of wondering what you see and if that's, um, you know, Anything about this that that would be helpful when John gets back that I can sort of say, you know, here here are some feelings, opinions. Br agree with me. They didn't, et cetera, et cetera, or whatever you would like to. Yeah, I mean, to me, I think that it, it it feels like there are many different things going on. I think that part of that is the attitude toward the existing structure of the 2002 edition. And so that, that one is dis, distinct from the original building, but it has the same style. And now we're adding on something that's stylistically distinct, but we're, we're, but we are continuing the existing uh, roof line. And then we're adding on another, another piece on the end that is, I guess, trying to mimic the gabled roof of the original two structures. So to me, it feels a little bit schizophrenic. <laughs> I, I mean, may, I guess if I had to like give my two cents about how to improve it, maybe, maybe some kind of joint between, between what's existing now and what they're proposing to add on. Maybe, maybe then I would like it better. I'm not sure, but uh, it does feel like, it, it feels like a lot of different things going on at once right now and, and they're not really communicating with each other very well. That's just my opinion. It, it, it's important in the sense that, that one of the key things about an addition is that it, it, it is distinct, you know, does not look like it was there as part of the original. And so, so there's um, this is maybe one of those places where sort of 
architectural sense is 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 uh, useful, or, you know, whereas some of the other things, you know, we were a little more, you know, um, have a smaller box to work in. But you know, here is you really are looking at what is the architecture of this edition, what's the architecture of the prior edition, and what's the architecture of the original, and do they fit, and do they work together, and um, so. I would ask, you know, from, from the subjective side, yeah, we're all, it'll always be opinions, but there are elements here that, that, so. I think, I think it's, I think I agree with Clayton. Um, I think it is, I think it is workable that an edition be placed here. And I think it's workable that a contemporary edition be placed in this location. I think I also am, confused a little bit that the that for a piece that is so different stylistically it's carrying the, the the same wall plane is is extended and the roof line is is contiguous so it seems a little bit funky in in that way and i guess the way that i i have my own sort of design critique for it but i think related to our design standards i think one of the things will be concerned is that this is really begins to be quite a long building in a residential neighborhood. And so that material difference and um, the roof line difference are important to break down the scale of those structures and maintain that kind of residential rhythm and, and proportion. Um, so I like the color difference. I like the material change, but I, I think they that, they that it needs a little more um, difference uh, when it comes to the roof line and the wall plane. Um, the back porch is a little funky. My concern is that it's it feels like it is not going to last very long. Um, <laughs> it's um, I'm just would have questions about the materiality of it and what's it going to look like in five years. Even it just seems like it's going to be warping and out of plane and kind of yeah. yeah. Maybe if there wasn't such a kind of consistent dimensionality to the, the the two different editions, right now it feels so relentless, like one, two, three. Maybe if maybe if it was a maybe if it was a little bit smaller or set back from that wall plane, as you're saying, uh, then it would feel so repetitive and so massive. Something that is maybe not this just another another um, letter in the alphabet. Yeah, I like the idea that it's related to the color of the hyphen. I don't know if the, the hyphen is charcoal now or if that's part of this design, but the, um, that is kind of interesting that it might be a material that repeat that kind of like pulls through the volume. I think there's some, there could be um, an argument too about how the multiplicity of the form and material um, takes away from the historic structure. Um, I think that uh, you know, a more consistent um, um, volume, um, you know, uh, with this, with the kind of issues of scale that you, you just went through, um, in some ways could make a, you know, could really set the um, historic structure off in a, in a, in a, in a very nice way. You know, there could be a great contrast between the two, but I think with the sort of, you know, ABCD um, repetition of it, um, it, it kind of gets lost there on the corner uh, with the, the, the more this thing grows. It, it's got that, yeah, like a, like a, a telescope. Um, Telescoping, yeah. That's what I kind of saw in it. Um, it's a funny sight too, because they're right up against the floodplain. And, um, but, you know, Woolen Mills is truly... And there's one of everything over there. Um, and, and things kind of like, they're not, there's not a lot of big tall, uh, you know, this, and I think the topography where it's this way, uh, these things are built up on the street. They seem short, but there are buildings that um, kind of grow to the rear. Um, I know it's like up there on Park Street, Breck, where down towards where Kevin lives that, those the houses along park look all low but if you go down that alley in the back these you know, almost three-story buildings um so um all right well these, these are helpful. I, guess, 
one of the other things that occurs to me is that the the um, the dormer without a window is weird. Um, and I'm kind of curious what it's getting them. Um, it's, uh, I guess it's an attic space or is it, a, what is it? Is it a room without window or, um, but. Um, looks like a, looks like a bedroom. There's a plan in here. It's a, looks like a master bedroom. That is strange because they, there is a window on the other side. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, it might, might be something to, I mean, it makes, it would make sense that there'd be, I would think they'd want a window and it might help also. Um, but if they don't need the window, then. Um, it, you're talking about in that, um, in the, looks like almost like a Ford and Batten uh, straight wall. Yeah. The gray mm -hmm. section. Okay. It's probably for privacy. That's the thought, maybe. I mean, I would I would almost prefer that the addition is more of a of an elaborated hyphen in a way, because then it wouldn't it wouldn't make the whole the entire building feel like it's it, there's a third component. It would feel like there are two and two. But I don't know if that gets them what they want. It just feel personally just a bit awkward with sort of you've got this gable just that just crashes into this big rectilinear mass. I don't really like the juxtaposition there, but I don't know if that's too much personal opinion. It's they do have a uh, floor plan in. I don't know if I saw that. Um, I was repeat just uh, I did mention a comment in the pre meeting, which was that uh, the 2002 edition. I think one of the things that makes it successful is that there is a hyphen to, to give that sense of yeah. separation between the original. And so if they could do something similar here, um, I think that would help it. Whether it's a step down or or just some little break, but that, again, it gets back to that crashing. It seems awkward and forced. Okay, super helpful, super helpful. Um, we'll be seeing this in, we'll be seeing it in a month. And um, it's, always, it's always fun looking at things through your eyes, uh, you know, how you guys, I know what I see and I, but it's, uh, it, 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 the group projects always better with this stuff like this. Um, right. the, Are we done with only, that? Are you set there, piece? Yep. And then um, I don't, we're still. We have one more of the mural. Do we need to discuss the mural? If, yeah, I didn't know if anybody, uh, you know, whether Clayton or, um, so, no, an opportunity, Clayton, David, so what these, um, let, let me just go ahead and introduce Good. it for the public. So 111 14th Street Northwest. This is a preliminary discussion for the a potential mural for which there are so, no uh, public documents, I guess, early on, but there are some that have been submitted to the BAR subsequently. And uh, yeah, so Clayton and, and David, this is, um, this is an organization in town that um, uh, probably knows where every uh, vertical wall is in the city and, um, you know, always checking on whether they can put a mural on it. And it's a, the, the bridge art initiative um, and, uh, you know, good people to work with and they've done a lot of neat stuff around town. So, uh, and Alan asked me whether or not the BAR would consider an application. And as I said earlier, you know, when you have a, a nonprofit and you can save them 125 bucks, that's what I, I try to do. So the um, we've traditionally um, the BAR has um, stayed away from painting of unpainted brick. Um, and and obviously, you know, for the reasons of, of, of um, you know, it's it's it, it's it's not reversible. Uh, but there has been, you know, some understanding that with a you know, more contemporary, modern masonry, less of a concern about uh, 
damage to to the brick wall and things like that and 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 that that idea of maybe civic art uh fits there and works there so um there has been one case in which the bar in the last four years did approve um, um a mural placement on a, on a, a more contemporary building the the other option is that um we require them to do you know some sort of sacrificial coating on on which the the, the artwork would be done and um but the the idea of of the bar's review is it doesn't review content um we do make sure that it's not a sign uh, that's done internally um and um so it's more of does a is a mural appropriate here um is a mural appropriate on this um on this wall, on this material, um, does it interfere with architectural elements, or are there sign components that it, that the mural would um, would interfere with or conflict with? And so, uh, this one's relatively simple. There's not you know windows and doors and things like that, but it's uh, it does kind of come down to that. Is it okay to paint an unpainted brick surface? Yes, no. If, if no, would it be okay to do it with a um, with a sacrificial surface? Yes, no. Um, and if if there were a unless there were really really you know reservations to this idea, um, you know, I could tell Alan, yeah, bring us a bring us a uh, request to consider, or you know, go find another wall. So yeah, it's Clayton and David, you know, if you guys, it's it's your chance to say something or say something. All right. What happened, what happened to the other side of the, was the other wall altered at some point? It looks like there was a wood wall that was put up. Do we know the history behind that? I mean, it doesn't matter. I guess, I guess yeah. my feeling is that, um, I don't know, I don't feel that strongly about it, but I think that, uh, a new canopy would um, certainly enhance the <laughs> overall effect. <laughs> um, and I, I guess I bring up the wood wall because you look at the wood wall and, um, you know, it's hard to make an argument about putting a small, but, but it's not really a mural. It's more like a, it's like a painting or a, like somebody was saying earlier on a sign. Oh, it's I hard see. To make an yeah, argument okay. about that. Um, just, I feel like, the, yeah, I feel like, um, there's certainly something that could be done there. Um, but yeah, I, I, mean, would, uh, I would oh, start sorry. with the, yeah, I would just, sorry, I would just start with the awning. I mean, I think I'm, I'm basically in agreement. I mean, I think, I think reversibility is always a good thing. Uh, but I think it's also, you know, it's a building designed in 1979 and uh, it's, uh, it already has a lot of colorful elements on the other side with the different awnings and the umbrellas. I mean, it's not, it's not really a kind of austere structure in my opinion. Uh, so, I mean, I, I feel like it's okay. I feel, I, I agree. I just add to my earlier comments in the pre-meeting that um, I think, I think my, I do think of reversibility is good. I think it is so uh, adjacent to the front door that I do worry about it being a sign or being read as a sign. So I would be okay with it even moving closer to the street to Sherry's uh, comment that it would be more visible from the street as one's traveling south on, um, on, on 14th Street. Um, and it uh, could be larger potentially, um, but uh, yeah. So you know, it's, it's kind of, of Sorry, Go on. in terms, my, my question is about the reversibility. I can, um, Jeff, you're talking about like a, a coating or a sacrificial material. Like, do you have examples of what that would be? Um, I wasn't able just... to look it up. And that's what, you know, sometimes I wonder if you guys will say, oh yeah, we know we, I, there's this some stuff right. out there, but um, Alan, you know, it, it, it gets to where it's like, oh, yeah, there's a stuff you can put on it. All right. And then, then the mural goes out. Well, can you get that stuff off the wall? You know, that right. might be great. But um, I'm. Um, I guess I'm, my, my, the reason I ask is the reason I ask because my concern is more about not like not necessarily opposed to a mural in that location, 
and I may not be opposed to it in the long term regardless, but when you look at the entire building that does house numerous uh, commercial fronts, you know, none of it's unpainted or none of it is painted brick. Um, our guidelines do say not to paint unpainted brick, so we would have to find a way to get around our own guidelines. Um, and that's just the only thing I think would be worth considering is is the building in the round um, because it does have a pretty significant front on 14th Street that you know, the shop owner is going to want to start painting something to. Um, but just plain devil's advocate. Well, it is a slippery slope. And it's, um, I would say, the only other project in which the BAR did consider the painting of the brick. There, was, there were several members who were opposed, but that was a, if you recall, a mural um, uh, that was to, to, to celebrate, um, you know, Heather and, um, uh, you know, what happened in, back in 2017. And, uh, you know, I, I will say, I think there was a lot of, it was difficulty. Nobody wanted to be one and said, no, you can't do that. But so maybe that this allows us to, um, there's no emotion here. I, I, some of the things, again, listening to you all, it's always helpful. It, it is a, once you paint it, it's painted. And, and Alan talked about this, uh, he said it's a non-woven, lightweight, synthetic fabric, space age polymer, no doubt. Um, in steer, with, install with an exterior gel medium that would adhere well and conform to the texture of the brick but could be removed. So probably have to say, all right, what is that? What are you, yeah. what are you talking about? And you know, what is, you know, everything can be removed. You know, the guy will tell you, I get me a, a power washer. I'll take it off. So there's, there's a, um, you know, I think I need to say to, you know, tell me more about what you want there. Um, but I'm, I'm inclined to, James, like you said, you just start to say, all right, at what point do we start just painting this building? You know, it's a death by a thousand cuts. Oh, because it's not, you know, 1920s painted, but only paint a little bit. And then, wow, we already painted it. Um, nothing else here is painted. Um, and Breck, I agree. That is, I don't know what's going on with the awning. That just looks like a bleached whale on the roof. <laughs> um, I was telling the others that we have, we approved an awning design. I don't. I'm pretty certain that wasn't that wasn't, that wasn't a, few, a few years ago. All right. I will. I will look at the awning. All right. That's. As you know, you do something with the you, you know you do something with the awning, and then you do something with the you know the recently added wood siding. Um, there could be something interesting. You know, there's there's potential there. That I mean, to some of your points, um, if you then painted a whatever it is, a ten by six uh, painting right on that wall, it you know it it sets it back, so it kind of sets back the potential of what could maybe be uh, something fairly interesting in that little nook. Yeah, it, it is, does have that kind of talk about invite uninviting. They they said you know the. The reason I wanted to do something is because people keep spraying graffiti there. Um, you know, I, I don't know if a mural precludes graffiti, but um, that was the, the rationale why. Oh, yeah, you can, um, you can see the graffiti on the Google Maps. It's like somebody yeah. sitting on one of those chairs just yeah. went to town. Darn kids. All right. Um, this is super helpful. I, 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 I know, I know what. I know what to do, and I'm gonna I, I I'm gonna recommend they find another spot, or they e explain to us what this sacrificial coating does and how it works, and and um and yeah, I, I think it's got to be it's just a slippery slope to start saying yeah you can paint a little bit because the next thing you know it's all paint and um and it's just a one more thing, and I know Sherry's raised this often, one more thing to really think about when we hopefully get moving this summer on the design guidelines review and um, um, and how we how we address that. Um, I don't think James has signed on yet. 
Um, I was going to suggest maybe if you guys want to take a 10 minute break and come back, if James is here, we, we can, um, uh, have a conversation with him. It shouldn't be long or, you know, I can tell him to come back next month. Choose your poison. Well, well let's do that. I, I don't, I think, uh, at least a five, uh, show five or 10 minute break. That'd work. He said he'd be here okay. at seven fifteen, and let's do that. Let's meet at seven fifteen, and we will we will bring this in by eight o'clock to satisfy Robert's prediction <laughs> and make us all happy. <laughs> yeah, there, Robert. Oh, he's he checked out already. I'm looking at these, uh, man.
Sherry, I've been meaning to tell you, I heard your voice on the radio several months ago. I'm almost pretty certain it was, were you work, doing a, 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 a marathon, a Costco marathon show? You're muted. You're muted. Oh. Sherry, you're muted. <laughs> WTJU's classical marathon at Christmas. Yeah, a friend of mine, Steve Harris, had me kind of pitch, co-host. It was fun. It was great. It was beautiful. It was really good. Thank you. <laughs> Glad you're a listener. I'm I'm on the advisory board for TJU. Oh, I love TJU. Yeah, me too. Great. It's a great asset. We are take it for granted. Um, really lucky yeah. to have that station. Um, I've got three, four, two and two, twelve, or two and two. Is Jeff speaking Chinese? I, you know, I, it's possible. I I've gotten into this habit of like. Like even Sandy called me up the other day. She was working from home. Goes, who are you talking to? It's like, no one. It's like, I have, like, I like, well, just I am. This is what two years of of of, of being in this room has done to me. I um, yeah, I I'm my own best friend, I guess. Uh, but I am. I'm trying to put together some images that I want to send or have Robert put up that um, wanted to get. Um, this is a little bit of homework for next month for you guys to, to, to so it's a good thing, it's a fun or a, a positive thing, but it's um, Robert and I had a good discussion today about all right, what are all the things that we have to tackle and um, and this is one of them and I'll you'll, you'll see in a second and uh, I'll give James a few more minutes, but I'm going to just uh, let me put this thing And it's an architectural um, historic preservation exercise that's um, that you all will will be making a recommendation on. But I, I, I think it would be, be great to have your 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 thoughts and assistance on. Um, Robert, I can't. I'm going to just send this to you. That's the best way to to do something to get it on the screen. Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. Save as, save as. All right, coming your way, Robert. The, um, and while that's on its way over, I um, wanted to tell you all about the, um, um, we met with, um, there's James, we met with um, James and I and Robert met with um, the design team on the courts um, a couple of weeks ago. And, um, I think we had a very positive meeting, very um, uh, above board. What do we need to do? Where, where do things stand? Um, and, you know, uh, I think there was some acknowledgement that yeah, everybody was got a little bit um, frayed at the last meeting. And I think that there's some very good understanding about how, how can each group communicate better. They also have some, some changes that they brought forward that were, I think really reflected what you all had said to them. And then there were other things where it was like, yeah, we're sort of, you know, the, our requirements have us here. And so I, I, we had a, a good discussion. I had urged them to um, attend this meeting and to discuss with you all, not the design, but 
what things do you want to see as far as making a decision for you know uh, um, you know, wall sections, samples, whatever, whatever the type of things that you all would like to see and in what way that would help make a decision. Um, I think they felt a little uncomfortable doing that without having, you know, they wanted to share the new design. And I said, well, let's, I don't want to, that, it's not the time or place for that because we didn't have the, the time to advertise for it. But I suspect that will be coming in in April. I, I think you'll, you'll like what you see. Um, and they were very receptive. And I, I, it was a, it was a positive meeting. I had gone in kind of, you know, ready to say, you know, they're not going to tell us what to do. And it, 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 it had been very positive. All right, Robert, do you have the, that I just sent you that PDF. If you would put that up on the screen, it's going to take two seconds. And then I see James is here, but um, so in, if, if everything goes perfectly, you know, and, war in Ukraine ends and the world is wonderful. Next month, Robert and I are hoping we can bring to you all, um, these are the six structures in a proposed uh, historic conservation dis district, uh, the CH Brown HC district, which would be at 12th and Rosser at the north end of 10th and Page. Um, the, the next piece for, for us is to, to talk with the property owners about what are the architectural character defining um, features that, that are important here. And, um, and then that would be coming to you all with a recommendation from the BAR because it's a zoning ch change. So you all would be making a recommendation on the, the change to the zoning and, and the change to the uh, to design guidelines, which are specific to each of the conservation districts. So, so I was gonna, I, and I can send this out to you all, um, just to say, you know, what, what do you all see? And, and not answering tonight, but what, you know, what, um, what are the things that um, we would suggest to the neighborhood um, uh, or to these six uh, property owners? And what, you know, from from the design uh, perspective. Um, what things look like, you know, what would you want to say are the things that would be emphasized. Now in the bottom right, that is um, the church that is an IPP that will remain an IPP. So, but, but it is, and, and, and David and, and Clayton, and I think maybe everyone else maybe don't know. So, so uh, Reverend Brown um, back in starting in the, the middle of the 20th century um, was a minister and also a worked for allied concrete and um on his free time, he constructed houses. Uh, he designed them and built them all over the city. They, there might be in excess of 150 houses like this that he built. And um, his son, Ralph, and, and I think uh, some brothers and sisters and cousins have really you know, come together and want to acknowledge um, Reverend Brown's legacy and, um, and starting with these six houses or these six structures. So. They're, you know, very simply built, simply designed, uh, cinder block, uh, and um, but it's a it's a neat opportunity to to, to recognize, a, you know, a contribution that, um, you know, maybe isn't architecturally elegant, but it certainly has it, 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 it's it's um, it's importance, and, and we want to recognize that. So that um, that's where I said next month. Hopefully, you guys can look at this go out there and we can talk about what you see. All right, so I have um, at the bottom of the Hollywood squares here, James Freeze, who is going to just give you all a, an introduction on where we are with the uh, the zoning rewrite, which is the, the, the next piece of uh, the comprehensive uh, plan change. So James, um, have at it. He's fresh off the soccer field, so he's all energized. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, as, as Jeff said, I'm I, uh, coaching my daughter's soccer team. So I, I thank you for your indulgence in, in allowing me to go last tonight and to wear a sweatshirt. I'm not typically, not typically the one to come to a meeting to the extent that any okay, of us come to meetings. We're all in, we're all in. Okay, fair enough, good. Uh, so yes, as Jeff said, my goal this evening was to um, uh, 
talk a little bit about our process and schedule for the upcoming zoning rewrite project um, and see if you guys had any questions on that project. Um, I'm hoping that uh, each of you will take an opportunity to review that work as it comes out and um, uh, get involved. And I understand uh, uh, Ms. Lewis, Sherry Lewis is um, the BAR rep I've, for the steering committee. And we connected, um, I think last week um, on getting her uh, up, up to speed on what's going on there. So, um, as Jeff said, we're on the, where you kicked off the zoning rewrite process. Uh, that's the third leg of our three leg CIVO plans together project. Uh, the first two legs were the affordable housing plan and the comprehensive plan, both of which were adopted last year. The um, zoning rewrite project is itself a three part project. So where we are right now is in the first part, which is um, our, uh, what we're calling the approach and diagnostic phase, or diagnostic and approach phase. And what that basically is referring to is that we are looking at, uh, our consultant team is reviewing the existing zoning and identifying where that existing zoning is out of step with best practices in zoning and, uh, and the adopted comprehensive plan uh, in order to develop our approach, which is going basically going to describe well, how are we proposing to, um, what are we proposing to change within the zoning ordinance? Uh, that approach uh, will be documented in a report that we're going to be releasing in mid-April uh, as a draft. We'll collect feedback on that and then finalize that report to share with Planning Commission and City Council, um, hopefully, hopefully by the end of June, that's our target, um, so that we get the nod from those two bodies that say, yeah, this is the approach we want to take. This is how we want to move forward which then moves us into drafting the zoning ordinance. The, the zoning ordinance, uh, the drafting of, that, of the zoning ordinance will happen over the course of the summer. And then uh, the draft zoning ordinance will be released in the end of September, beginning of October timeframe. That's our target. Again, that then kicks off a period of time where we're seeking feedback and input um, in, in with the goal of, of uh, doing a final draft of the zoning ordinance document uh, by the end of the year or so, which puts us in a, in a time frame for adoption of around this time next year. Back in, putting this back in front of Planning Commission and City Council. So I'm calling that our measure twice, cut once approach. Um, what can I say about it? A few things I want to note. Uh, one of our objectives with this new zoning ordinance is to simplify and make this an easier to read zoning ordinance, um, easier to use. I tend to work from a philosophy that I want, uh, that zoning is something that's, um, well, often most people don't pay much attention to zoning. It is in fact very important to what, to understand what you can do with your property, or understand what can happen in your neighborhood. And so the zoning ordinance itself should be an approachable and easy to use, easy to read document. Um, so that's our guiding principle going in, going into this drafting process um, and will be reflected in, in all the work that we have coming forward. Uh, that means that it'll be an ordinance that has a lot of illustration, a lot of easy to use tables and charts, um, and it'll use simple language. We're gonna try and stay away from legalese. Um, uh, the other thing to note is we have updated the website, so I encourage everyone to go and take a look at that and see the schedule is laid out there. More of the information that, that I've shared can be found there. Um, one of the things we're trying to do in this phase is also release information that makes zoning itself an approachable topic for, for basically the layperson who doesn't understand, who, who may not understand much about zoning, um, so that everyone can participate in this process. Um, on more or less equal footing, or at least there's an opportunity to do so. So we've created a glossary of common zoning terms that's on the website. Um, we're gonna be building out a zoning 101 presentation, and I'm actually working with a group of UVA students who are gonna be um, uh, building out some uh, flyers, pamphlets, uh, printed material, web-based material that not only uh, 
explain the zoning in, in kind of approachable terms, but I'll also take the recommendations uh, coming out of this approach report and um, make those approachable, understandable. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's the schedule, that's the process we're looking at and what we have going on. Um, one other thing I've been reminding folks is that our, our marching orders, if you will, on this zoning ordinance come from the comprehensive plan. And in particular, I encourage people to review the land use chapter and the very first goal, which says, the very first goal in the land use chapter of the comprehensive plan is write a zoning ordinance effectively. Those aren't the exact words, but it says write a zoning ordinance. And then it's got like two pages of guidance as to what we're looking for in zoning. Um, I've done this work in uh, a number of places. I've seen it done in a number of places. I don't know that I've ever seen this much guidance in a comprehensive plan for the zoning. Um, so it's fantastic. We've got a huge amount of guidance to start with. Um, so we've been able to hit the ground running. Um, so let me open it up to see if anyone has any questions uh, for me. James, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about um, the last part that you were describing, this uh, the, the rewrite and the, and the education that, that this process will provide to the community. To what extent will explanation of uh, design control districts be included in that? in that language? Uh, that's a great question. You know, I don't, I don't know that I've dove, dove into that particular issue much yet at all. So um, it's a good point and something that I'll note for um, the team that we probably should make sure that our materials include uh, some information about the design, about your, the BAR and the role that you guys play, yeah. Say, so guys, I, I had mentioned to you. Um, so the the key task in this is that they're reviewing the, the ordinance relative to the to the to the comp plan changes. But it is also our opportunity to express um, anything we've got with the, the the ordinance that addresses the historic districts and the, the conservation districts. So it's a that, that's why there's sort of two pieces to it and. You know, that I, I still want to encourage you all to take a look at those regs and if you had suggestions about what could be done or how, how they could be done. Again, it might, it's not necessarily the focus of what is happening here. It is a, it is a key piece of that. And you know, it's our opportunity to, to, to get those ideas in. And then um, the, you know, there are those questions of, of how does the, the you know, things that are happening throughout the city and things that are related to our design control, you know, the BAR related things. And I think, you know, it is that um, my, in, my invitation to you all is, is that um, there are, uh, we merged the chapters, the land use chapter now has the historic preservation and design part of it all incorporated in one. So it, it, it's um, being able to say, what the BAR does is doesn't happen throughout the entire city, and how, and are we you know looking at the ordinance in that way? Are we you know sort of helping people understand that um, what's done in the, in our districts doesn't happen everywhere, and, and just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, and that's where, and I think Sherry, you're on the the, the work group, but but the BAR can certainly have conversations. We can incorporate that into our meeting agenda to. to to sort of discuss things if we have ideas or, or, or something that we want to, you know, have Sherry take back to that committee. So that's, that's, you know, just want to put that piece in there as well. And, and let me note, um, first, I'm more than happy to come to any meeting of the BAR throughout this process as we go forward. Um, uh, you know, that, Quite honestly, I value the time and I value the expertise that you guys bring to the table because you guys are working in a, a piece, of, essentially, of our zoning program overall. And um, so if there are, you know, to, to, to say it again, you know, if there are policy changes that you guys think we should be considering at this point in time um, or just 
things that you've always felt don't work well or could be done better. It, it would it would be really valuable to us to hear about those. Um, and frankly, the sooner the better. So. Yeah. I th I th I'm excited about the process, and I think it's a it's a it's a really important time. We don't get that many opportunities to communicate with directly with the public about what this board does and what our um, historic cons conservation and, and design control districts do. Um, I'd say there's there's even within the people that we speak with, um, there was part of that confusion is because people don't do this every day, but also our role has changed. Um, the rules that were written when these first, um, when the first um, uh, preservation guidelines came out, it was to seem to me to be, to protect a certain kind of architecture uh, in a, you know, in a city that, you know, that uh, um, was pretty narrowly focused on, on, a, on a certain kind of architecture and a certain kind of uh, parts of the city. And what we found is that those rules have been, uh, um, while they might've been narrowly applied initially, they've been really effective um, over the, um, as we've uh, understood more about the history and context of our um, community, they've been useful in preserving pieces of architecture and districts that, that weren't um, deemed special or worthy of distinction earlier. And a lot of the public doesn't understand that we see it that way or that, that it's a really important tool. And looking forward, I think it's really imperative that um, the community understand the, the, the kind of um, amazing gift that we have to use the legal framework that protects these districts to grow in a way that preserves that the, the opportunity for their stories, that the, it's a diverse set of stories. It's not the, not the original intention. And um, uh, if there's any way that we can help um, have that be part of the narrative through this process, I think it would be a good opportunity to do so. I appreciate that. That's, that is a, that's a, great, it's a great story. It's a great part of this, yeah. Yeah, that is it, folks. I think it's the it's the opportunity. This is not a you know, react to what comes out of a committee. This is these are design uh, related discussions that we can be contributing to um, uh, proactively. And, and I just want to just I'll bang my pots and pans together. And Breck hears me talk about this all the time. You know, it's the sort of the the design professionals, this community kind of you know, there's a great opportunity here to say what. Where do we want to head with Charlottesville? How does this comp plan, how do you take the vision of that comp plan and, and, and relate it into things that can be you know, implemented in, in you know, uh, transferring that, that vision into a, to a, to a plan and, and language and, and, uh, that, it, that expresses the vision? So uh, that's it. That's my, my rah-rah speech. You all are invited. And I, uh, with that, if, if you all don't have any more questions for James. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's yours to. Well, I've got a question for Sherry. And just since you've had a little bit of a head start and maybe maybe only a meeting or two, but is is there a way that you are think, approaching us yourself or, or a way that you would like uh, uh, us to, to work um, amongst ourselves to support you as a, as a participant in that process? So I wasn't aware of the first meeting. <laughs> James, I guess there was a, anyway, miscommunication. I didn't actually know I was on the steering committee. I know he's supposed to be the BAR's rep and a meeting happened and I wasn't there. So James, and then I was on vacation, I think two weeks ago when James sent me an email saying, oops. So I haven't had any chance to participate to your first question. I don't, I mean, I personally don't have an agenda. I, I would say that I have the good fortune to have been on the planning commission when we did the most recent large overhaul of the zoning ordinance in 2003. And then we did some updates, I think in 2005, I'm dating myself here, but, but it helps, that helps me to, 
and and I guess just because I'm a little bit more, you know, as the BAR members, we don't deal that much in the zoning ordinance. You know, we do, our purview is enforcing the guidelines, interpreting the guard, guidelines, and you know, approving or denying COAs based on the guidelines. And I'm not I'm not saying we don't care about the zoning ordinance, but I have a little bit more background, I think, um, just because of my practice and also my time in the planning commission um, with our zoning ordinance. So I don't really have like, I really don't have any like burning agenda, like something that I really want to see improved. I'm completely support James's goal to have it be more approachable. Um, especially in the just the zoning, like the zoning code. And this is the part that we do deal with most as the BAR, this, the parts of the zoning code that deal with building envelopes, setbacks, sort of all of those, regu those regulations and in the different districts, it's really hard. Um, you know, our use ma ma matrices are really use useful and those are easy to find. But I think if you, weren't familiar with our districts and you were just like a new owner or prospective owner in the city, it would be really, it's not easy to figure out what regulations apply to your property or your prospective property. So that's one, I mean, I, I just know I've been tripped up and I, you know, know the different, you know, mixed use districts, residential districts, districts period, and I'll be tripped up and think of properties in one. And it's, I mean, I know there's a place where you can find it, but but there, it seems like there should be a little bit of consistency, um, maybe based on just the zoning designation in the city instead of what district you're in. And I, and I, I, I get that districts have a different flavor than others and a different way they were developed and different purposes and just a different fabric. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's a lot of repetition in the zoning ordinance. So that's the only thing that I really thought about. And it, I don't, you know, I know that's for me. It's a trip up. I don't. I'm not bright enough to know what the solution is. <laughs> I'm sure James um, and the steering committee can come up with it. But that's one. That's the biggest area that I think is used a lot by residents, consumers, you know, citizens. That it's not always easy to get a real easy question. And I think once we, I don't want to say transparent, but once we make it simpler to find those answers then I think NDS will get less phone calls, you know, and a lot of, honestly, I'm not saying this to suck up to our staff members, but I mean, I don't know, I don't know how many times I've told a client or just a friend that asks, you know, they'll ask me a question. I'm like, I don't know. I would call the city and talk to Brian Haluska or Missy or, you know, and because I, you really, you really don't know. Um, and, and maybe I would say some of it is, is up to it historic interpretation of staff members who've not not yeah. trying to commit any mischief but they've sort of had to fill in the gaps yeah to what those regulations don't say Sarah, so, you found my ulterior motive uh oh trying, <laughs> trying to reduce those calls yeah it's it's i mean i've said it before like i've said a million times i don't know call the city and i feel bad but there's but there, when, when a zoning ordinance doesn't present solutions and when it isn't really easily ascertainable and isn't a good tool for development or guidance, you know, about building regulations, I think that's, you know, that yeah. will be on it. This will, will be on a good side of a lot of, you know, staff work that hopefully won't have to be done, you know, when we're done with this rewrite. So anyway. Yeah. But those are the only ideas I have really, Breck, but thank you for asking. And I just said, go again with the, you know, the how the BAR, you all are, you exist because of an ordinance. Uh, you're not, uh, you know, an appointed body that uh, provides recommendations. You are, you exist uh, by ordinance and, and have very specific rules. I would say those rules or that ordinance is, is poorly written in some places and, and, because there are a lot of times I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that phrase. And so you all, I just say, encourage you to be involved in the, in the land use side of things, but also in, in just looking at how, you know, how does the BAR do what it does and, and does something need to be tweaked 
that that helps us do that better. So. Well, as I said, I'm, I'm more than happy to come back again at any point in time to this process. Um, and um, I look forward to working with you guys going forward. Great. Sherry, I saw you started to speak, but you're muted. Well, I was just going to uh, reminisce, but I mean, I, I'm sure James is aware of this, but really before we redid the zoning ordinance in 2003, five, um, the city, I mean, the amazing amount of growth we've had in the city, good, bad, or you know, indifferent. Our zoning ordinance before that was a suburban style zoning ordinance, basically based on like a suburban county. I mean, we didn't have mixed use districts. It, it is it is amazing what zoning and not even not up zoning, not down zoning, just changing what's you know defining what can be done has has done for our city and i'm i'm not applauding development as a end or be all or goal but our city i think is better for that you know that first stab at getting to mi mixed use districts at getting to define our entrance corridors which hadn't been defined before a lot of things that were tackled in that rewrite it's pretty unimaginable mm -hmm. how it was before then you know be when jim tolbert came here um so it's it's it, it can be a great tool um, in a lot of ways, and it can be a tool for preservation too. I'm not saying that it you know development is the end. It can be a great tool for preserving things that the zoning ordinance wants to preserve, like a certain building regulation within a district or a zoning code or you know a zoning designation or whatever. So anyway. Uh, thanks for tolerating my walk down memory lane, but just for those who haven't been in the city for very long, we really have gone a lot of like really far in 20 years on this. Um, but we have further to go. So. Sherry, what was the, I've been asked about the BAR's role in that last um, rewrite and that and I had people say, well, the BAR wouldn't let this happen or wouldn't let that happen. And I, I don't I don't recall the BAR ever having that much influence. But so what do you have any institutional memory on how the BAR was uh, involved the last time? No. And I think we were rewriting the guidelines about that same time. I don't I wouldn't say we as the BAR, but you know, Mary Joy and staff and interns were. So probably that was happening at the same time. I don't remember, you know, a good person to ask would be Joan Fenton, who served as chair during that time, or my recollection is about that time. She would have a, a good memory, but I think she served two terms. Um, I don't know. That's a really great question. You know, I, I don't remember the BAR having a role in it. So I, I hear maybe everybody on this things. call just <laughs> breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sherry's doing the work and we don't have to. That pesky zoning ordinance thing. Well, thanks for coming to us, James, and good to meet you and talk to you a little bit longer. <laughs> we'll, we'll be seeing you down the road this year, it seems like. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you for the time. Thank you, James. All right, do we have anything else on the agenda? There was a other items, but I don't, I don't think it didn't get the sense. No, no I mean, other items. No other items. The only one is I will say I did not hear from any of you about the Belmont Bridge. So I, I, I took that as a positive sign. And, um, but if you had any questions, um, or if you're wondering what I'm talking about, now is a good time to ask, but. Where is the location of that sample? It's, um, I sent it on that map. If you, okay. you know, the, 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 yeah, on, Abe, on go it's on the Belmont the side and try to walk through the parking lot. Yeah. So, yeah. but we're, you know, just to be clear, we're not in a okay it, don't okay it. Right. It's, um, <laughs> you mean the, the place we've been the entire time? Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right there. It's, uh, um, I don't know. I, 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 but I, that I didn't hear back for it was really, it was one of those like, okay, you know, 
something happened. They didn't get it or they don't know what I'm talking about. So I was a little surprised, but I'll, but I'll take it. It's, um, it's. The, the only I, comment I made was that the, the, um, the panel right above the striation had a really bad stain from the release agent. And I didn't know if that was approved or if we're to expect that or. It, there are, there's performance criteria, quality criteria, which you all were, I think Carl primarily in writing that sort of the, the this is, these are the things that the criteria for us to accept it. So BAR participated in that, but it will be the city project engineer and the, the engineer that's doing the project to um, approve those products based on those guidelines. So it, it was sort of a catch 22 because I said to Jeanette, well, what is it? If the BAR doesn't like something, you, what is it that they can or cannot like? And um, um, but I said, to me, it has the striations that the BAR had wanted, um, whether it was too light a gray or too dark a gray, or whether the, you know, the, the concrete looked more like concrete here than there. I said, that's, that's, that's not, you know, I, I, I like, I like material that looks like material. I said, um, there was, for example, there was some, some pitting, um, you know, just naturally happens in concrete. And I said, well, if you're not, if you don't want pitting, then, you know, spray it with paint and fill everything or let's build it in latex but it's uh so uh, i think the engineers finding some things to be critical about but um it, it, it's um it's it's things are moving quickly over there uh, so we should be able to see things um, being erected i think that there's some uncertainty about handling these panels that have these very sharp edges and and i just said to them i don't know how you're going to keep those things from getting tore up I've, I've built too many things in my life and and um but that you know that's that's their headache to deal with so but if you're curious go take a look but there's not much we can do to to, to change the uh, the trajectory was there any was there any feedback on uh, the discoloration kind of that you see there i mean everything's consistent was, except for the, the the upper panel yeah and they picked up on that um that was uh, you know one of the things they immediately said um the um they don't want that to happen and that it would be um so they address that i you know i offered the idea of um painting them or sealing them i said these things are going to get graffiti on it you know why don't we pick a color that then you can paint over to cover the graffiti but um, um that was that sounds like something that's going to cost extra that they don't want to do but uh um, you know, I think if you go up and stare at any surface, you're going to find all kinds of problems. But I think when you step back and, and look at it, kind of squint your eyes, it, it has a um, it, it has the look that you all were looking for. And um, we'll see. We'll see what everyone thinks in, a, in another, what, nine months. Sounds good. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Robert. Patrick, Thanks, guys. All the, all, all the other staff. Um, do I hear a movement, um, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Great. Thank you all, everybody. Right. Have a great month. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. Watkins, for letting us leave at eight. Uh, <laughs> no, that's all you. That's all you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night.